Hello and welcome to explaining Rust Analyzer video course, where we try to understand how Rust Analyzer works under the hood, one crate at a time. Last time we looked uh, at the heart of Rust Analyzer, the main loop, the code which drives the whole language server forward, the code which takes input from the editor, processes it, and then uh, returns the result back. Today, we will finally start digging into the implementation of Rustizer proper. We will start understanding how the parts which touch the Rust language work. And uh, to start on this journey into the depth of Rustalizer, uh, we need to understand the underlying project model. So. We already know that Rust Analyzer works with files and that files are organized into disjoint file sets or source root. We also heard that it has some notion of project model of crates and dependencies between the crates, but we haven't seen this model exactly yet. So today we will look into this. Let's go to the Rust Analyzer, uh, Rust Analyzer directory. Switch to the main branch and open our editor. Yes. Uh, by the way, we will also uh, touch a little bit on South Saturday. So the crate we will be looking at is base database. Uh, I guess uh, in terms of ratio uh, of lines of code to the actual usefulness, well, uh, let's put it uh, that way around. Uh, the ratio of importance to the amount of source lines of codes, the base database is like the most important crate because it is really small, but it is really important. Everything, everything which Rust Analyzer understands and analyzes uh, is derived from the original input data, uh, which is defined in this crate. Uh, like in every information system, you usually have some set of base facts and some set of derived facts like materialized views in SQL, uh, caches in um, HTTP servers or something like that. So yes, and the base data, the underlying ground truth constrains the amount of derived facts you can compute. And this base database uh, is in a sense, the definition of the base facts of Rust Analyzer. Uh, first, let's quickly look at two things, this trade source database and trade source database ext. We will explain them shortly. For now, it's sufficient to understand that they are hooks for Salsa to define inputs. Uh, as you see, uh, stuff here is annotated with Salsa input attribute. And as we can see, the amount of inputs is really small. First of all, uh, for each file, we know its text. Then for each file, we know uh, which source root it belongs to. And then for each source root, uh, we know the set of files which comprise the source root. So uh, these two queries are in fact like a single relation in the relational uh, model. Finally, we know the credit graph. So before we dive uh, deeper into how this salsa, create, uh, salsa traits work, uh, let's study what a create graph is because we already know about strings and we already know about source roots. So uh, yes, uh, here's the definition of source root, which we saw last time. Uh, basically, it's just a, a set of files and a, a flag which determines if this root is something from create AO or something from um, a local project. And the file set is just a mapping between file IDs and virtual file paths. Okay, so now let's look at the crate graph and the motivation for it. Uh, the crate graph was one of the earliest design decisions in Rust Analyzer, which was fundamentally different from what Rust C is doing and which turned out to be very useful for providing IDEs. Typical compilers, including Rust-C, like to work on a single compilation unit at a time. That's actually even tautological. 
the completion unit is a entity which the compiler works uh, on in a single go. So when you compile a crate, uh, a graph of crates using Cargo, using RASC, what happens is that RASC compiles, first compiles the leaf crates into internal representation and R lib file. And then uh, it proceeds and compiles dependent crates. And each dependent crate receives those already compiled R libs as an input and then produces the output R lib. So in a single run, in a single process, compiler looks only at a single crate, only at the source code of a single crate. For all dependent crates, it has already compiled representation in the R lib form. Uh, this is great for command line compilers because it allows you to have separate and parallel compilation. And it allows you to do stuff like avoiding recompiling certain crates if dependent crates haven't changed or something like that. Unfortunately, this separate compilation idea doesn't really work in IDE setting. And the reason for that is that in the traditional compiler, you only have dependencies in one direction. So uh, let's say, uh, yeah, probably need some illustration. Let's say we have crate A and crate B. And uh, inside crate A, we have struct. And inside crate B, we have use A as and then some function which actually creates an instance of S or something like that. When you do compiling, you can compile crate A without thinking about crate B at all. It's only when you compile crate B that you need to be aware of crate A. However, in an IDE, that's not enough because, for example, you might want to find usages of this struct S. And you really want to find usages of struct S not only in this crate, but also in all the other crates which depend on it. And for example, we can totally do this. We can look for find usages of source root. And yeah, because I've just opened the editor, it takes some time to do uh, initial indexing. Yeah, and we can uh, find that this source root is used all over the place in the project. So again, uh, Rust analyzer, uh, traditional compiler needs only go to definition. And for go to definition, you can compile B separately and then go to definition inside A. You can only go to definition to your dependencies. For find usages, you actually should go in the reverse direction. And that is fundamental philosophical reason why an IDE cannot work on a single crate at a time. That's why Rust Analyzer doesn't have a concept of a current crate. It only has a concept of a set of crates, the crate graph. And uh, the crates have dependencies between them. So uh, let's take a look at how crate graph is represented internally. First of all, uh, it is a real graph. Uh, crates are identified, uh, crates are nodes, and each crate is identified by crate ID. The data stored in a node is crate data. And to make it a dependency, crate data stores dependencies vector, and each dependency points to another crate, and also uh, it points to another crate using a specific name. So uh, that's actually a pretty interesting fact that in Rust completion model, crates don't really have names. Uh, when you interact only with cargo, uh, it might seem to you that like the name of a crate is a thing. Like there is Tokyo crate, there is uh, Regex crate, there is, uh, I don't know, Fastrand crate. But the real truth is that crate name is a lie. There isn't such a thing as a crate name. There is like the only name you have is a name on the 
dependency age between two crates. And so the following situation uh, is possible. Actually, uh, let's just write some code. So you can start with empty crate graph, and then you can say, let's add three crates, a B and C. And what you can is you can say that crate B that crate B depends on crate A using name like X and then crate C depends on the same crate A, but using the name Y. I can't type. Yep. Now still can type. Yes. So uh, as you see, this, this crate doesn't inherently have a name. It is known as uh, X in one crate, and it is known uh, as a Y in another crate. And this is like, this is my favorite, uh, my favorite uh, bad grammar. This is my favorite uh, feature of a Rust language beyond lifetime. So I really like how lifetimes allow you to use this C++ compilation model and C++ runtime performance and the memory safe. But after that, the reason that there is no global namespace of things and that you can really describe software in modular way without fear of name conflicts, uh, name conflicts is super cool. And one specific issue, which is uh, possible, uh, one specific thing which is possible in Rust exactly because of this absence of global names, is the dependency resolution uh, Cargo uses. Specifically, if you have a crate graph, and this crate graph contains uh, two different major versions of the same library, like you have uh, RugExp1 and RugExp2. Cargo is capable to compiling this crate graph without any kind of naming conflicts, exactly because RugExp1 and RugExp2 don't actually conflict in names because they don't have names. Uh, one crate might be using, yes, and um, mm -hmm. uh, one crate might be using RugEx and another crate might be using a crate called RugEx, but they actually might point to the uh, different crates. So in terms of uh, this snippet of code, the situation would be symmetric. So, uh, no, I guess it won't be symmetric because I actually need uh, four crates here. So let's say that like crate A depends on rig X and that is crate C, but crate B depends on the crate, which it also knows like rig X. But actually, this is a different crate D, so this is possible. Yeah, anyway, uh, crate graph is uh, a graph of all crates. It is guaranteed to be acyclic. So uh, when we add dependency from one crate to another crate, we actually run a depth first search to make sure that we don't enter a cycle. And if we enter a cycle, uh, we actually return an error. And if you are using Rust Analyzer in some complicated projects, you might actually have seen cycle errors uh, in the login output of Rust Analyzer. And uh, those cycle errors uh, are there. I've lost my editor. I'm extremely bad at actually like hitting the right keys. I always press for own shortcut and uh, then everything goes wrong. And that I guess is the reason why I don't use Vim. Anyway, uh, you might sometimes see errors about cycle cycles in the log. And the reason for those errors is that when we try to lower cargo project model to our internal crate graph. We do not do this 100% correct yet. And that sometimes might create cyclic dependencies where there aren't any. Uh, I wonder if I should 
say more about this. Yes, I guess uh, we will cover this specific case uh, later in this video. But for now, let's proceed with understanding uh, what else uh, is there in the credit graph. So, okay, uh, create. Crate graph is a graph of crates. And each crate contains a list of dependencies, and dependencies are those things which have names. We store a name of a crate here, but this is a display name. This is something you just print during diagnostics or in debug output. This isn't something which actually meaningfully affects the semantics of a language. And notice how we really love strong types in Rust Analyzer, in that we use two different names, uh, two different types here. We have crate name for the actual semantically uh, correct crate name, and we also have uh, crate display name for things uh, you want to display to the user. And there might actually be different because, for example, if you name your crate with dashes uh, in Cargotomol, then, well, in Cargotomol it, be, it will be with dashes, but the actual crate name would be different. What else uh, do we have here? Well, actually, uh, everything which contains, like, uh, anything, uh, which is needed to compile the crate and needs to be specified here explicitly. Rust Lizer isn't allowed to use any kind of I.O. to get ambient inv information from the environment to compile the crate. So let's go uh, through all the fields one by one. First, we need a root module of the crate. Uh, to remind you, the way Rust compiles uh, code is that it starts with the root file like uh, lib.rs and then it discovers all the files comprising the crate by recursively parsing every module so we start at librs then we see that hey there is module input so we go to input and parse that and then we notice that there is change and we parse that and fixture etc etc and uh, there is no nested, nested modules in this crate crate but if you imagine if there are nested modules we go recursively there and by, by the way the module we are looking at is called input because, well, it de uh, defines the input to Rust Analyzer. Okay, we are looking at create data. Yes. Uh, the next thing is addition. We obviously need to know the addition of a crate to compile it correctly. Uh, display name we've uh, already covered. The CFG options uh, are the things you place into CFG attribute. So things like test or Unix or feature CRD go here. And one interesting thing to note here is that features are squarely a cargo specific concept. The Rust language itself doesn't have a concept of feature. It only has a concept of CFG flag, which is a key value. So uh, the way uh, Cargo implements features is that it parses uh, something like this on the command line to the compiler. So it literally repeats this feature several times. And the Rust CFG specification allows you to actually associate many values with the same key. And when then when you evaluate uh, a CFG like the semantics here that who should be present. And the, that this is called a feature is completely arbitrary. Cargo could have used like a toggle here or something like that. So again, uh, features are cargo specific concept. And yes, this is actually very, very important, uh, which I haven't uh, covered explicitly before. We do want this part of Rust Lizer to be completely independent. Again, uh, this was one of the early design decisions, which actually started paying the dividends, paying the dividends only like a year ago. But 
initially we really designed the whole system such that it doesn't know what build system is used by the specific project. And that's why rather than using cargo metadata directly, we lower the representation we get from cargo metadata uh, to this create graph data structure. And that's why we don't have a features here. We have CFG flags here. And initially that was uh, kind of like not really meaningfully useful distinction because well, everyone uses cargo, but it turns out that for example, today, uh, Rust Analyzer is used by Facebook. It's uh, for bug build system. It is used in Google using, uh, I'm not actually sure if Google uses it with Puzzle, but I know that Android, well, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I recall that they wrote about that in uh, one of the blog posts. Android uses Rust Analyzer with uh, their like bespoke build system. And uh, those recent patches for Linux kernel also use uh, Rust Analyzer with their bespoke build system of Linux. And the reason why they are able to is that we don't constrain the cargo to be the only source of truth about project model. We can basically ingest arbitrary data, convert it to the create graph and use that as the underlying like ground truth uh, of what is there. And that's actually another important uh, architectural principle in Rust Analyzer is that when we try to transform some data, we always try to understand what is the ground truth, which properties of data are really essential and which properties of data are accidental. And uh, we've actually seen this example here, like the features are accidental. The features are cargo specific concept, but the CFG flags are fundamental. They are the Rust language uh, concept. Similarly, uh, in cargo, you have packages which have targets like binary targets, test targets, etc. etc. So packages and targets are cargo specific concept. They are an addition to the underlying model. And the underlying model uh, is this crate graph thing. Yeah, anyway, so uh, we have CFG options. We have potential CFG options, uh, which is used. Uh, this is like a, a recently added feature, which is used for completion. Uh, obviously, when you compile something, you need to know only the set of the actual CFG options. But if you do something like uh, CFG target OS, to be able to provide this completion here, you, well, need to know the set of possible CFG values. And well, the set of possible CFG values is like arbitrary. It is possible to run Rust C with like special flags such that like this actually compiles, like not, not, not really compiles, but actually uh, this uh, operating system uh, gets implemented here. Yeah. I guess, uh, I guess if uh, I ever write an operating system, that would be its name. Uh, but uh, that's not interesting. You are only interested in kind of like real things, which typically are present there. And this is stored in this uh, potential CFG options. And again, this is somewhat heuristically uh, determined because we cannot say upfront which are the real uh, set of possible options here. Another interesting thing, environment. So uh, in Rust, you have... Um, You have an env macro. And what this env macro does is that it looks up the value uh, in the environment at compile time and inserts it as a compile time string. And obviously inside the compiler, the env band macro is implemented by calling to std env var function. So In Rust C, we run this. And then uh, for our crate, we get this at compile time.
Verse C can do this because, well, obviously it's like really easy to just uh, see what is your current environment because, well, RAS-C compiles a single crate at a time and it makes sense to uh, speak about the environment of a particular compiler invocation. This completely doesn't make any sense for Rust Analyzer because we look at the whole crate graph. We have many crates and the actual environment for a crate might be different. Uh, well, it actually is different. For example, uh, cargo always sets up a uh, cargo package name, environmental variable. And this environmental variable is obviously different for every crate in your crate graph. So we have to deal with that. Uh, that's why we explicitly represent environment as an env map. And uh, in Rust Analyzer, the implementation of env bank macro actually looks into this uh, environment. Actually, we can just take a look at that, I guess. So uh, let's invoke find usages. And here is uh, yes, here is this uh, implementation of and building macro. And it uh, seems like we have some some really funny special case, like uh, if, if you try to look without gear and this environment variable is not set, we try to uh, say that you should enable it uh, in the settings. I, I wonder if actually should remove it because we now run build scripts by default. So this, is, this, isn't, this isn't really that, that important. Uh, actually, uh, while looking at just here, uh, we found another interesting one uh, in procedural macros because, yes, procedural macros obviously uh, can look at the environment of a current process. And uh, we also need to fake it because we don't compile a single crate at a time. So when we run procedural macros uh, in this dedicated process, which runs those macros, we actually call setenv to set up the environment. Okay, let's go back to create data. <laughs> no, that's the other kind of create data, which we'll be covering separately sometime. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in Rust Analyzer. And actually, uh, note, uh, when we will go deeper into implementation, actually, we've already seen this. Uh, in Rust Analyzer, we generally like... Mm, let me show you. Uh, we like spelling types like this. We don't do just message type. We do LSP types message type. And that is because Rust Analyzer is so big and it has uh, so many layers to it that there are uh, frequent naming conflicts. For example, if you take a look at something like structs, you can see, yes, we have like three things called struct. And there is also struct data and struct datum and two different struct kinds. This actually, this actually seems suspicious. Why do we need uh, three different struct kinds? Okay, yeah, that that that, that, that kind of makes sense because this is actually data carrying uh, anyway. Yeah, basically, qualifying names is good for large projects. So, environment. Uh, dependencies we've uh, already covered and uh, proc macro. Proc macro is also an uh, interesting thing. So, we do expand proc macros and we do it by running procedural macros in a separate process. And this is, that's basically one giant hack because we need to keep everything deterministic, but proc macros are non deterministic. So, we like do some trickery there. And we treat proc macros as inputs to the Rust analyzer. We do not compile, like the way we expand proc macros is not by looking for source code of macro and compiling it and using that compiled code to actually expand macro. No, what we do instead is that we ask the build system, hey, build system, please provide us with compiled proc macros 
provide us with .so files which contain proc macro dynamic libraries. And then we load those dynamic libraries and use them to compile macros. So macros are an input. They are stored in the create graph. And uh, this is the only input which isn't database. It's not just like JSON. It's some uh, trait object which has expand method. And uh, behind the scenes, this trait object is uh, backed by this IPC implementation where the IDE process actually asks proc macro server process to do the expansion. And we need to run macros in a separate process because we need uh, to protect against macros just crushing everything with system uh, with uh, std process exit zero. But that's probably is a topic for procedural macro crates, uh, procedural macro lecture. Uh, anyway, uh, this I think covers it. Now, I want to briefly come back to the topic of cyclic dependencies and where they come from. So uh, let's uh, write a short example here. Yes, I trust myself. So let's say we have a dependency crate. Which has some public method. And this dependency crate. Okay, uh, this also needs to be a library. This dependency crate actually uh, depends on the parent crate. And yes, so um, not sure if we can visualize it. Right, let's try cargo tree. Mm -hmm. And okay, so uh, that's uh, what we get here. And this actually compiles. So if we try to break this and to say that example also depends on the depth crate, uh, we actually get an error. However, and that's like hilarious, you can do it like this. And this will work, like uh, really work. So let's say we have up a fun example here, and in depth we let's actually just say pub use no. Uh, Oh my God, it's very nice rain outside. Anyway, uh, we can say extern create example. I, I, I haven't wrote extern create declaration for ages, so I don't even remember the correct syntax to, to expose it. Yes, and here we can actually write the test. And here we can call example, obviously, but we also call can call dep example example. And this works. And these are actually different things. So uh, let's say we have struct s here, and then we can say. That S1 is just S and 
S2 is And so this will compile, this won't compile, because these are actually different crepes types. So you cannot do something like this. Uh, it says that it kind of like expected S, but found S, and they are different. So at this point, you are probably extremely confused. And this is indeed a very confusing thing. And that is because there are more crates here than you actually think there are. Because let's count the crate. Uh, let's count the crates. First, there is crate which is compiled like this. RC uh, example, SRC libres. Let's call this A. Then there is B. RC example dep src lib.res. And this one uses A. But there is also the third crate, C, which is Rust C, example uh, src uh, libres dash dash test. And this is a different crate. So these are two different compiler invocations. So they compile two different crates, and this one uses B. And there isn't an actual cycle here. It's just that this S is from A, and this one is from B. So, uh, what does it mean? It means then that when you write cargo project, every Rust crate is actually duplicated. There are two versions of each crate. There is this crate, but also this crate compiled with, with dash dash test flag. And if you've seen duplicated messages in cargo, and you probably have seen them like every time and they should really bug you that there is just like the error which is reported twice so that's the reason why the errors are reported twice because actually there are like two crates here so how do we deal with this in rust analyzer in the ideal situation we actually want to create a separate node for each crate in the crate graph and uh, make it work basically just make a crate graph uh, twice as large. Initially, uh, we had some concerns that that, well, that basically means that you have twice as much data to compile. So we didn't do that. Instead, we only had a single crate with dash dash test enabled, because obviously you kind of want to get IDE completion inside your test functions. So yes, uh, one, more, one more important note, this crate actually doesn't have this function because uh, the test gets eliminated very early in the completion uh, phase. But this crate does. So by default, we used only these crates. And uh, if you lower cargo project model uh, like that, well, then you get this problem of cyclic dependencies. And if I open the output here and uh, switch to Rust Analyzer, uh, let's actually reload uh, the workspace because part of those errors are simply because I was editing Cargotomal uh, to get to the stage. So yes, uh, as you see, we get this cyclic depths example. Uh, cyclic, de cyclic depths error, and we get this from uh, this depth first uh, search check. So, uh, what does it all mean? Well, it means that Rust Isaac currently is buggy, and that we really should change our lowering strategy to create two different crates in a crate graph for a single uh, cargo crate. 
uh, and we just uh, didn't get to it. I think that should work fine. Uh, but it also shows like the power of uh, underlying model of a crate graph that we really can correctly reason about these kinds of situations. Uh, and to be clear, uh, there are more cases where you can get this aliasing, where you can get separate crate graphs, which point to a single root file and like physically the source code for them is shared, but which are actually different logical entities with different types, different struct, etc., etc. And the biggest uh, contributing factor to that is actually just uh, cargo features. So like the absolutely correct IDE would actually create a separate crate for each combination of features you have in your cargo tomo. And then it would merge like completion results and errors from all of those combinations. We currently don't do this. We currently pick heuristically some specific uh, combination of features, but even in that case, you still have this nasty uh, duplication problems if you want to deal with test correctly. Okay, and this actually is taken longer than I've planned. So uh, we covered just um, basically the crate graph, uh, which is important. It's like one of the core data structures, but we uh, didn't actually get to other stuff in base database, like this change thing and this picture thing. So I guess uh, let's rename the current lecture from uh, maybe a little bit too ambitious base database to just the crate graph. And let's call it a day. Thank you for listening. Bye.